put it like right here. Okay, it's off right now. Yeah, if you will and turn it on. Okay. Let's okay. This is plugged back in. Why is it not? is my oh, okay. <coughs> like it's not on the right okay yeah it's it's acting like it's uh sees it. Okay. <laughs> Hello. I guess let's get going. They say you should always get someone to introduce you, but um, I think that would be kind of useless here. <laughs> uh, But if I wear the hat, you can't see my beady little eyes, so I'm going to leave it off for now. <laughs> OK. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 111st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. 111 is pretty old. Even I'm not that old yet. I will not be 111 for another 50 years. I'm only 61 this year, later this month. Maybe that's special. So maybe I should have a special birthday party later in September. Uh, really, though, g given recent history, I'm very lucky to be having a 61st birthday at all. We announced the Pearl Six Project back in the year 2000, 15 years ago, for those who can do subtraction. Just since then, my health hasn't been great. I've survived two cancers, two cataract surgeries, and two retinal surgeries. I've also sur uh, survived two economic downturns and two layoffs. It seems I've done everything in twos. I even married off my two daughters. That was hard. <laughs> and last year, I had double pneumonia, if that counts. So today, I'm going to be talking about the number two. Maybe you thought I was going to talk about some other number, like maybe six, <laughs> and the letters P and L. Indeed, you might have even thought I was going to talk about Pearl today. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm much too self-centered for that. Those of you who've been paying attention, you know by now that all my talks are really about me and what you think of me. Say, how do you like my new hairdo? I'm so vain, you bet I think this song is about me. Oh, the wonderful thing about Larry's is Larry's are wonderful things. Tiddly palm, tiddly palm. But the most wonderful thing about Larry's is I'm the only one. Well, maybe there's uh, a few other Larry's in the world, like Larry Ellison, um, Larry Moe and Curly, Larry the Cucumber. So OK, maybe I lied. Uh, I'm not just interested in me. I'm also interested in everything else and everyone else. 
Well, almost everyone else, maybe not Larry Ellison. <laughs> so I like to talk about everything and everyone, too. Today, however, I mostly want to talk about J.R.R. Tolkien, because Tolkien also comes in twos. Those of you who love Tolkien do so primarily because he wrote two really famous stories, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. You may have heard of them. So maybe we'll talk about six anyway, since Peter Jackson made the two Tolkien films into six, uh, two, two Tolkien books into six films. Uh, also, we call the Lord of the Rings a trilogy, but that's because it consists of six bucks, books, bucks, books, bound together into twos. There's that two again. You know, I could get into this numerology thing. Arguably, The Hobbit should have been made into two movies instead of three. So what if we add them instead? Uh, what can we say about five? Well, I finally watched, I finally watched the, uh, the last Hobbit movie last month. Uh, and uh, so maybe we can say that Pearl Five is like the battle of five armies. In this battle, five different cultures come together and fight, kaboom. And Pearl Five was also a convergence of many competing cultural forces, and these forces tended to fight against each other. And the battle was not pretty. Neither is Pearl Five, but that's okay. Pearl Five is a great success and still is, and will be for many years to come, just like The Hobbit. When Tolkien published The Lord of the Rings, it did not make The Hobbit any less of a good book. And just the same, Pearl Six does not make Pearl Five any less of a great programming language. The point I'd like to make today is that Pearl Five is like my Hobbit, and Pearl Six is like my Lord of the Rings. At least, that's how I think of it, and have thought of it for many years. Maybe you prefer to keep these ideas further apart. But really, there are many parallels. <laughs> cheap, Unico cheap Unicode tricks. Uh, anyway, two related stories, two related computer languages, and there really are many, many similarities. For, in for instance, it took Tolkien 15 years to write his sequel, and it's been 15 years since we began the Pearl Six effort. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> Anyway, if you're young enough that you're just now seeing the Hobbit movies for the first time, then you're very lucky. You didn't have to wait for them. Being young means you don't have to wait a long time for the sequel to come out. It already exists. As for the books, uh, The Lord of the Rings was originally published about the time I was born, so I was lucky there too. People who read The Hobbit in 1937 had to wait 15 years for The Lord of the Rings. So here's the general principle. It doesn't matter if something took N years to develop if those N years are now done. <laughs> 15 years is not so very long. You should be glad that I used the Tolkien metaphor for this talk. I could have picked a different metaphor, such as the children of Israel wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years before we got into the Promised Land. That would give us, let's see, um, 25 more years to finish Pearl Six. <laughs> and, and that would make me like Moses. You probably know about Moses. They said he was the humblest man on the face of the earth. That fits. <laughs> I'm very humble, too. I'm very proud of how humble I am. <laughs> and I get to carry around this great big stick that can part the Red Sea. And I'd get to go up on Mount Sinai, and I'd come back down carrying those stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. Uh, unfortunately, if, if I'm Moses, um, then I also have to go up to the Promised Land and die on Mount Nebo just before I get there. Oops. Uh, plus, I really don't have any commandments for you. Uh, just a few announcements. For example, today I'd like to announce that we should get ready to party. And we should do that because um, I forget. Maybe it will come to me later. Announcements, announcements. Um, what does that remind me of? I'm getting as bad as old Barlamin Buttermere at the Prancing Pony. One thing drives out another, you know. Announcements. Ah, yes. Announcements reminds me of Bilbo and his birthday party. I don't like half of you half as well as you deserve and all that. Um, two books, 
two parties. I guess Tolkien liked parties. I like parties too. Maybe we should have a party or two parties. That would be twice as good. Uh, but not now. Back to those mountains like the one Moses went up. The Hobbit is all about Bilbo's trip to the Lonely Mountain. In the same way, The Lord of the Rings is all about Frodo's trip to Mount Doom. And this correspondence is really no accident. Great authors steal plots from other great authors. And Tolkien was so great an author, he stole from himself. Uh, many of the plot elements of The Lord of the Rings are stolen straight from The Hobbit. And there are many examples of this. For instance, the party at Bag End, uh, both stories start with a party. Both stories are about going away from home and then coming back home. Both stories are how good it is to be at home, especially when you aren't. Uh, the travelers first go to Rivendell to ask elves for advice. Then we get bad weather in the pass. Then the uh, travel party tries to go through the mountain pass and doesn't succeed, so then they go underground and fight monsters there. After you go underground, you, you make new unexpected friends. Um, you, you know, kind of like Yapsi, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, after that, you, you, you meet with more elves, etc. Float down a river, etc. 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 Um, both books are, are really about growing up after you think you're already an adult. And I can deeply empathize with that. I'm still trying to figure out this growing up thing. Well, hey, if I live to 111, I've got another 50 years to figure it out. No hurry. And Pearl is also about growing up when you need to. From the very start, I designed Pearl to be a language that you can learn gradually. So you might say, Pearl is like Middle Earth itself, presenting you with larger challenges just when you become ready to meet them. Or maybe a little before you're quite ready to meet them, if you're a hobbit. You know, if you're actually ready for a challenge, then it isn't one, is it? Structurally, both of Tolkien's books are episodic quests, uh, with new creatures to deal with every chapter or so. In The Hobbit, Bilbo learns to deal with wizards, dwarves, trolls, giants, goblins, golems. Well. I guess there's only one golem. Golems are kind of like tiggers, too. But the most wonderful thing about golems is, 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 is I'm the only one, my precious. <laughs> and wargs and eagles and werebears. Well, I guess there's only one of those, too. Bad trees, spiders. The spiders, of course, designed the original wood wide web. Selfish elves, selfish humans, selfish dwarves, and of course, at the end of it, the boss. I mean, the selfish dragon. Uh, similarly, in The Lord of the Rings, the hobbits learned over time to deal with a bad tree, um, a barrel white, men, midges, elves, crows, cranky wizards, orcs, <laughs> balrogs, a dead wizard, a wizard who ought to be dead, <laughs> Elves who live too long, men who live too short, trees who walk and talk and live too long, resurrected wizards, worm tongues, golemses, orcses, more orcses, oh yes, my precious, <laughs> spiders. Well, really only one spider this time, but she lob is big enough to make up for it. But the most wonderful thing about spiders, no, let's just not. Okay. <laughs> More orcs, we hate them forever. Um, eagles, kings, minstrels, you know, how, you know how the story goes on and on and on. <laughs> but for all its length, The Lord of the Rings is still basically just a reimagining of The Hobbit. We have a phrase for this kind of reimagining uh, where you fix up everything that was wrong. In our industry, we call this second system syndrome. Now, you might, think that the Lord, you might think of the Lord of the Rings as second system syndrome, except that Tolkien actually finished his redesign. He figured out how to do second system syndrome and make it work. So, Pearl Six is also proudly a second system. In fact, one of our many slogans is second system syndrome done right. By which we mean that 
We expect to take a long time, but we also expect the, pro the project to converge on a solution eventually by Christmas. We just never said which year. Similarly, when we compare Perl 5 and Perl 6, you can see many places where Perl 6's underlying principles are stolen straight from Perl 5. It's oddly useful. Uh, we have sigils as noun markers. It's, oper it's an operator-rich language. It it's expressive, but hopefully learnable. We think visual distinctions and the shapes of things are very important. Uh, we think easy things should be easy, hard things should be possible. It's multi-paradigmatic, scalable, practical, you know, on and on. But there are also some deep differences between Perl 5 and Perl 6, just as there are deep differences between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So let's look at the two books first. Um, to begin with, the stakes are a lot higher in The Lord of the Rings. In The Hobbit, almost everyone is just greedy. The dwarves, the dragon, the goblins, the elves, the men, even Bilbo to begin with. It's all rather um, petty. So it's, it's really rather surprising and refreshing at the end when Bilbo suddenly decides to be unselfish instead. We all start out like Bilbo. We're pretty comfy in our little hobbit holes, but we're mostly motivated by what we can get out of life. And sometimes uh, that leads us off onto adventures. And like Bilbo, some of us discover partway through uh, that just getting stuff is boring, and the real fun starts when you start giving stuff away. Now, some of you may know that it was my privilege to help with the founding of the open source movement. Uh, not just Perl, but Patch and RN and other things. Um, I measure my own worth by what I can give to other people, not in what I can get back from them. By any conservative estimate, the net worth of what I've given away can be measured in billions of dollars. Now, of course, there's no way I could ever accumulate that much money, and it wouldn't have made me happy anyway. So I found an easier way to do it, by giving it all away before I ever got it. <laughs> and so my little hobbit version of Pearl did save a lot of people a lot of time over the years. I think it probably has saved you some time. But the hobbit also has certain fundamental flaws which were addressed in The Lord of the Rings. Specifically, in the second chapter called The Shadow of the Past, we find out that the ring, which Bilbo thought was harmless, is actually a really bad thing. Events that seem trivial in the first book are reinterpreted as being about something bigger, deeper, older, more fundamental. Many of you are here, are here <laughs> I suspect most of you are here, because you like Pearl. Uh, and you may think you like Pearl just because of its syntax, but really many of the reasons you like Pearl are deeper than the surface features you think you like. That is why Perl 6 changes surface features, but brings out many of the deeper concepts that are implicit in Perl 5. Perl 5 and Perl 6 are really part of the same story, just as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are part of the same story. Interestingly, Perl 5 and The Hobbit share the same weakness. In order to be acceptable in their original cultures, they both repackaged a lot of earlier culture without questioning how it all fit together. In The Hobbit, Tolkien used various traditional notions about how trolls and fairies and goblins and such should behave. By and large, they're all rather silly. In the case of Pearl 5, I also adapted existing cultural traditions. Uh, regular expression syntax it comes from Unix. The operator, operator precedence table is, is borrowed pretty much straight from C. And the type system works much like it does in awk. So, when you first try to do something revolutionary, it helps not to look revolutionary. Bilbo succeeded by being invisible some of the time. In a sense, Pearl also succeeded at the beginning by being invisible some of the time. Pearl kind of blended into Unix culture as if it were just another Unix tool. At the same time, Pearl was intentionally revolutionary. It violated most of the modernistic and reductionistic principles that Unix was founded upon. Uh, Perl also worked by keeping his type system invisible from the user. Unfortunately, Perl was also confused about his type system, and that's one of the things we had to clean up in Perl 6. With The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien rethought all of these old memes and reintegrated them <laughs> into a, a bigger new world. Similarly, Perl 6 takes many of the cultural assumptions of Perl 5 and reintegrates them to fit together better. 
one of the most radical reformulations happened in the area of regular expressions. Regular expressions were already a huge mess in Unix culture, even before Perl adopted them. So Perl 6 patterns are completely redesigned. They are now powerful enough to write complete grammars in. In fact, these patterns are powerful enough that the Perl 6 parser itself is written using them. I really wouldn't want to write a Perl 5 parser in, in Perl 5 regular expressions. Yeah, sir. I'll leave that to Adam. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's extremely ironic that just when various other languages were borrowing Perl 5 regular expressions to get better pattern matching, Perl 6 was, at a was abandoning the old syntax in favor of something much more readable, powerful, and integrated. But this only begins to scratch the surface of the differences. You know, sometimes people ask us, what makes Perl 6 better than Perl 5? <laughs> yeah, how can you answer that? It's like trying to list all the ways Tolkien improved as a writer between the two books. It's like trying to explain Middle Earth. Eventually you give up and just, you say, just read the book. You know, Tolkien is really a romantic writer, which means you can't just explain his world. You really have to experience it to understand it. But maybe we can come up with a few highlights. In The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien learned not to be overly specific, but rather to rely on the reader's imagination. So in The Hobbit, we have trolls talking in a Cockney accent. <laughs> Blimey, lamb yesterday. Uh, but in, in Lord of the Rings, we get black riders who crawl around and hunt you by sniff, sniffing, creepy. In Perl 6, we also learned that many programs are too specific about how to do things. So we made more constructs that tell the computer what to do, not how to do it. In the future, for instance, more multi-core programming will rely heavily on code that does not specify the order of ex execution. So we have several ways to do implicit concurrency in Perl 6 as well as explicit concurrency. In The Hobbit, the various races are pretty much typecast into stereotypical behavior. Elves always act like elves and dwarves always act like dwarves. In The Lord of the Rings though, Tolkien developed much more finesse in his characterizations of, well, his characters. We find elves and dwarves playing contrary to type and learning to be friends. The type system in Perl 6 is, is also much more developed than in Perl 5. If you like moose, it's like that, but it's built in and based on a complete meta object protocol that allows you to generate new types of types and map those types to various underlying memory models using representational polymorphism. Fancy words. But using these primitives, we can su support low-level native types and high-level types such as roles, traits, subset types, enumerations, and standard class-based types. None of these are really built in. Even the meta classes themselves are defined in terms of meta classes and representations. Method dispatch policy is similarly flexible. Really, you know, no language in history has ever been designed to be as flexible in Perl 6 in my humble opinion. This extensibility extends to the language itself. Um, the Hobbit assumes everyone speaks the same language, more or less, but in The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien worries a great deal about the languages of Middle Earth, and he's always trying to get just the right list linguistic tone in each passage, whether it's Elvish or Dwarvish or Orcish. The same progress happened from Pearl 5 to Pearl 6. The horror of the internals of the Perl 5 compiler is that c Perl 5 continually lies to itself about what it's parsing, which means that it's often doing multi-pass parsing internally of the, on the same text, slightly mo modified. That means that Perl 5 often doesn't know exactly what language it's dealing with. All the problems with source filters, all the problems with regular expression interpolation, those come from multi-pass parsing. In contrast, Perl 6 always knows exactly what language it's using in any particular spot. Uh, let, me, let me illustrate the difference. Here's some Perl 5 code um, to remove duplicate words. Here we match a word, a word boundary followed by a word, some white space, and the same word. Notice that the backslash one on the left side and the dollar one on the right side are really the same substring, but we can't refer to them the same way because of the crazy interpolation and reparsing rules in Perl Five. Here's the same thing in Perl 6. Notice first that 
we don't need the backslash uh, the slash x to, to allow white space because that's the default in Perl 6. So you don't have to go back and reinterpret the white space in your head, and neither does Perl. The word boundary markers are now directional, uh, and our back references now start at zero rather than one because it's really just sugar for a subscripting operation into the current magic match object. Yeah, it's a magic object too, I guess. But the important thing to notice here is that we can match dollar zero literally inside the pattern now. Uh, patterns are no longer strings. They are just a language in their own right, one of the many sub-languages of Perl 6. Parse, just like the main language is parsed. It's all done with one pass parsing, switching to a sub-language in a scope and then back out at the end of that scope. It's kind of like the Lord of the Rings has all these other languages of the elves, the dwarves, and the orcs mixed in from time to time. And in fact, mixed in is more apt than you think. All of the sub-languages in the parser actually work by mixing in the appropriate methods to parse and implement that subject sub-language. The grammar automatically writes a lexer for you, so you don't have to write one yourself. All this happens just in time, so you can change languages on the fly at any moment. In theory, a single declaration could turn your Perl 6 program into Python or Java or any of those other orcish languages. <laughs> just kidding, kinda. But this works on more subtle scales as well. For instance, um, one thing we like to show is that it's trivial to add a, a factorial operator. Here, the function body just multiplies all the numbers from 2 to $n. Uh, and the thing in brackets there is just a reduction that says put a star between them all. Uh, you, you might wonder if it works right when $n is 1. Yeah, it does, because Perl 6 knows how to find the uh, identity value for multiplication. That's, that's cool, but that's not the interesting part here. This code actually mixes in a new grammar rule to the old grammar, writes a new lexer for you, and installs it as a new language in time for the next statement to use it. Of course, it prints this, since we support big integers by default. And in fact, it installs your new language even before the body of the definition, so you can use your new language to define itself. Here's a more classical recursive definition. Notice we can use the, uh, the bang notation even though we're not done defining it. This all works because Perl 6 knows precisely which language it's parsing at any point, whether you're talking about operators, as here, or regular expressions, or the various quoting sublanguages like QW or, or regular quotes. It's what allows you to create your own slang languages as well. I think it's really the killer feature of Perl 6 and the feature that will allow Perl 6 to evolve into the future for a good many years. You are limited only by your imaginations and, uh, and by the, the tempers of your, your colleagues who will have to put up with your uh, pretensions to the rank of language designer. Those of us who have designed languages uh, successfully know that there are a great many more people out there who think they know how to design a successful computer language. But you know, it's not just about the technology. To design a successful computer language, you really have to be a world builder like Tolkien. Uh, you're making a new place, after all, where people can play and work, but play mostly. But beyond that, you also have to have a team of companions like Frodo and the Fellowship of the Ring. Up to now, I've been talking about this from the viewpoint of Tolkien, so it sounds like I'm the only person creating Perl. I'm not that big of an egomaniac, far from it. It would be like Frodo going to Mordor all alone. No, thousands of people have contributed to Perl 5. Uh, not as many for Perl 6 yet, but on the Perl 6 IRC channel, we, you know, at any time probably have more than 200 people logged in. Of course, many of these are lurkers and occasional contributors, but many of them spend far too much of their time helping me, and not just by doing what I say. Um, I learn a lot from them, too. Information flows both ways, in every direction and at every scale. And together, we learn as much from our failures as from our successes. And we've had some of those, <laughs> and uh, of both. In the Perl 6, Perl 6 community, we have a lot of hobbits and elves and dwarves and wizards, and of course, the occasional troll. But we, we work hard to find ways to get along. You don't always have to agree with your companions on the road, but it certainly helps to be friendly when you disagree. 
one of the things that Tolkien is always keenly aware of in his stories is the timing of things. He gets the calendar right. He gets the seasons and the phases of the moon right. Surprising how many authors don't get the moon right. Um, much of the plot turns on exactly when things happen. Both books have the characters either waiting because they have too much time or hurrying because they don't have enough time. After the breaking of the fellowship, one part of the fellowship is tearing across the fields of Rohan at top speed while Frodo and Sam are creeping slowly over the hills of the Emin Mule, trying to get to the dead marshes where progress will be even slower. But even when our heroes are making steady progress on a journey, journey just putting one foot in front of each other or, or rowing down a river, you always get this forbidding, forbidding sense that the clock is ticking. And whenever the plot like breaks into concurrent threads, uh, Tolkien shows the entanglement of those threads to the reader in various ways. I mean, you might have two different groups viewing the same sun sunset from different places, or you might have a body floating down the river, by, floating by on a canoe. There's a glow of a palantir on a tower that says things are happening, or a Nazgul screaming out from Minas Morgul to fly out over Gondor. Both stories depend on this kind of precise event timing. In The Hobbit, you know, turning trolls into stone exactly at sunrise, or meeting Gollum when he's lost his ring, uh, getting the dwarves into barrels just in time, uh, jit barrels. And those eagles, you know, they're really show-offs. They always have to arrive just in the nick of time to save the dwarves from burning trees, or to win two different battles, or to rescue Gandalf at least twice. A beam of light that will like fall onto a map, or a keyhole, or a gate at just the right moment and illuminate it. We could go on and on, but The Lord of the Rings is all about multi-threading. The entire progress of the war depends on each thread of the Broken Fellowship initiating an entire chain of just-in-time miracles that bring all of the resources to bear on the main battle just in the nick of time. And of course, the war itself is just a distraction to get the hobbits through to Mordor in the nick of time to save the armies of the West. Oh, and of course the eagles have to rescue Frodo and Sam from the burning lava just in the nick of time because, well, that's what eagles do. Well, enough about Tolkien's sense of time. Uh, a lot of Pearl 6 technology is also about timing. Uh, but before that, when, when we were first designing Pearl 6, we worried more about space than about time. We noticed that Pearl 5 has way too many globals, and globals are just generally bad news for threading. So for Pearl 6, we thought a lot about hanging every object on the right peg, as it were. You know, otherwise, the dwarves might get their hoodies mixed up. Uh, different things belong in lexical scopes, or in file scopes, in dynamic scopes, or as uh, in, in interpreters, in threads, in meta objects, uh, or in classes, in file handles, in various other places. So we, we thought carefully about that. Later, we started thinking about having things happen at the right time as well. Liz just talked about our, our new fancy uh, concurrency primitives, but even at a more mundane level, the progress of compilation, linking, and execution has many different phases of ac activity. And each of those phases naturally wants to be able to schedule various activities at the most appropriate time. This isn't really a new idea. Uh, you're, you're already familiar with Pearl 4's, Pearl 4, Pearl 5's four main phases. Uh, begin, check, init, end. Since these run at various phases in the program, we ended up calling these phasers. So when they are triggered, we call it firing a phaser. Thank you, Captain Kirk. Well, wrong universe. Actually, we should thank the AUK programming language for, for beginning and, and, and end, at least. Uh, check and init run at the end of the official compilation and at the beginning of official runtime. Often these are run together, but if you've pre-compiled something and used it later, the check might happen days or months before the init. Now, just having, having these phases puts Perl 5 above most other programming languages. In Perl 6, we can also schedule events when we enter or leave any scope. When we leave a scope, we can also commit or roll back transactions. Uh, we, can, cause we can trigger decision points in loop, on the decision points in loops. And we now have explicit handlers to trap both normal exceptions and control flow exceptions. Uh, 
These are convenient for built-in scheduling, but for user-defined uh, concurrency and scheduling, we've got promises and channels like Go, as Liz described. We've also got built-in event programming, which we call supplies. And if you don't know what that is, it's like the opposite of lazy lists. With a lazy list, you run code when somebody pulls a new value from it. With a supply, you run code when somebody pushes values into it. For example, uh, in Perl 6, signals are naturally handled with a supply. So you, the signal uh, uh, function there uh, returns a supply, and then you call act on that, and that schedules something to do when that signal, when that event happens. And that's the event processing is all just built in. And these high level primitives have pro proven to scale well, well in practice. And together with our hyper operators and feed operators, I think Perl 6 will be ready to deal well with the, the complicated computations in multi-core and many-core processes. So supplies push values, but with a lazy list on the other hand, you can pull values on demand. This makes it quite easy to represent arbitrarily large concepts without imposing arbitrary limits. For instance, here's how you can define the Fibonacci sequence in Perl 6. That just says to start with a 0 and a 1, then generate more values by adding the two previous values, then keep doing that till you reach, well, we don't say when because we don't care. We read that as my at fib equals 0, comma, 1, comma, whatever plus whatever until whatever. Um, another fancy example, Here's, here are all the prime numbers. Um, we can test for primes, but uh, this just makes a, a list and tests them for you. Now, we love to trot out these fancy examples of laziness like this, but you know, really, laziness is not in there for the, the fancy examples. It's in, it's in there mostly for the most mundane of reasons. For example, um, here we don't have to tell it how many 42s to generate. It just generates how many you need to do the slice assignment. And laziness is not really just about lists in Perl 6. Um, many other things work better when you delay them to the appropriate moment as well. So in Perl 5, list context versus scalar context is determined at compile time. And this turns out to be just a little overspecified. In Perl 6, context does not really happen until your argument list is actually bound to the function's parameter list. So that simplifies how, how signatures work. In Perl 6, you can return a failure from a function without throwing an exception. If you test the return value, it looks just like an undefined value. So you can use normal control flow to handle a situation, you know, or defined or, those sort of things. But if you ignore the return value, or try to use it as a real value, then you'll get an exception with all the original information about where and why the error occurred. So we get the best of both worlds, depending on our, our preferences in handling error conditions. It's like use fatal without having to be fatal all the time. This results in much cleaner code than languages that overuse exceptions to signal normal conditions. Uh, I'm looking at you, Python. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, Perl 6 parser, uh, it really doesn't know, it doesn't actually know what sublanguage you're going to use until you declare it. So it computes a new language for you on the fly and writes your lexer for you just at the moment it's compiling your program. Uh, on the other hand, the parser knows that all the declarations are happening at compile time, well, really at begin time. So unlike many dynamic languages, it gives you excellent error messages if you misspell one of your names because it, it, can, it can depend on what has been declared. And most other popular dynamic languages can't tell you that till runtime because they don't respect the timing of the begin phase as Perl does. Ironically, Perl can do all that static checking pr precisely because all those meta objects can run code dynamically at compile time, at least in Perl 6. So yeah, we, we worry a lot about timing in Perl 6 too, which finally leads us into today's little matter of timing, which is maybe why you're here, really. I have announced an announcement, cried Bilbo. <laughs> Earlier this year, we made an important announcement at FOSDEM. Um, for many years now, the joke has been, of course, that Perl 6 would be ready by Christmas, we just wouldn't say which one. And every year, some small number of people would miss the joke and think we, we were really planning to have Perl 6 out that year. But this year, my faithful companions and I decided that 
we have a pretty good chance to get an official beta version out by my birthday in September, and an official version 6.0 out ready by this Christmas. Christmas, 2015. That's an actual year, in case you've forgotten by now. <laughs> we never promised that before. And we're not exactly promising it, or we're, we're like projecting and planning for it, and hoping real hard, and we've been working really hard on it too. But it's a little bit of a pseudo promise because there's always caveats, of course. Um, let me list a few. <laughs> Caveat number one, if I get run over by a bus tomorrow, I'd expect, no wait, I, I wouldn't be expecting anything if I got run over by a bus. But you should expect that the release would be de de delayed, maybe by as long as a week or two. <laughs> That's probably about what my contributions are worth at this point compared to the rest of my companions. And people keep making me write these strange speeches instead of working, don't know why. Uh, second, we're all volunteers. Uh, real life or real death can happen to any of us. Part of our culture is that we require people to take care of themselves and take care of the, their loved ones around them because that is more important than meeting an arbitrary time goal. So basically, it's not just me, but each of us reserves the right to die and screw up the project completely. Um, or that didn't come out quite right, but you get the idea. Um, third, the definition of Perl 6 will just be the test suite at the end of that time not all the possible features that we've talked about over the years. We'll probably strip out all the tests that are not implemented yet, take whatever we have and that is passing at that point and call it 6.0. Or, or maybe we'll go with an alphabetic version and, and call it 6.Christmas. Uh, the rest of the tests will be implemented in later versions, but we're already converging on a feature set that will suppo support both long-term stability and long-term evolution. So it's time now to produce an official Perl 6. Fourth, there's no requirement that all the current implementations of Perl 6 get there by Christmas. Uh, only the Rakuto compiler will be supported by Christmas, and Rakuto has more than one back-end VM, and so we've decided to concentrate on more VM this year. We might get other back-ends by Christmas, such as the JVM, but that's not our top priority. We're kind of like Frodo and Sam on their final journey to Mount Doom. You recall they had to get rid of their orc armor and even Sam's beloved cooking gear because those would have weighed them down too much. We're not quite that desperate yet, but same idea. More VM is our priority. Fifth, uh, while the implementation of Perl 6 is getting faster all the time, especially on more VM, there will still be a lot of room for improvement after Christmas. Some things will run faster than Perl 5, some things will run slower. A few things will run a lot faster, and a few things will run a lot slower. C'est la vie. Sixth, well, what can I say? It's going to be exactly 6. 6.0. .0.0. Nobody in their right mind expects a 0, 0.0 release to be perfect. Sure, we'll pass all the tests for 6.0, however we define it, but the online documentation is still a work in progress. Certainly, there will not be a book yet. And you should expect some bugs, including at least one or two major security flaws. C'est la mort. All that being said, uh, People who are using Perl 6 already are having an awful lot of fun with it. The good kind of fun. Uh, the sort of fun hobbits, hobbits can have even when sitting in the wreckage of battle. We optimize for fun. Uh, but, you know, sometimes maybe our definition of uh, fun is just a bit masochistic. Just think when parrots have coming out parties. How do we schedule coming of age parties uh, in real life? Do we do this when our kids are old enough to vote or rent a car or sign a contract? when they're old enough to get married or get sloshed? No, we usually throw these parties for them um, when they're still in their mid-teens. Are they really grown up yet? Not a chance. Uh, we do coming out parties before our kids re reach full maturity. Just because your daughter reaches age 16 doesn't mean she's ready to tackle all of life's little problems, like hormones and boys and boys with hormones. <laughs> so the coming out party is really part of the process of growing up. So what do we have left to do before Perl 6 is coming out party? Well, I'd like to think we're in that final polishing stage, that bit of charm school we teach our kids before showing them off. As Tolkien writes in his preface, after writing The Lord of the Rings, he had to rewrite it largely backwards. It's that backwards business that's the hard part. In any large project like this, it's always your earliest decisions that are in some ways the weakest. So last year, we identified three areas we need to rewrite this year, and these are not, surprisingly, in some of the fundamental areas that define how characters, native types, um, and lists work. 
it was important to do these three things this year because we didn't want to put out an official version of Perl 6 that would immediately become wrong, and each of these three things had the potential to change how the language works. The first thing we wanted to get right is called normalization form graphene. No, you won't find this term defined in the, by the Unicode consortium, but it's where we think the future of Unicode processing is going. Unicode defines two major normalization forms, NFD and NFC, which correspond to fully decomposed or versus fully composed graphene rep representations. But many things that a user would think of as a single graphene do not, in fact, have a pre-composed character in Unicode, even in NFC. So you can think of NFG as NFC done right from the user's uh, perspective. If the user thinks of a sequence of characters as a grapheme, NFG will compose a temporary grapheme character for them. Uh, as a result, the user can think of each of uh, his, uh, the characters in his or her own language as being exactly one character ride, wide in a fixed width list of graphemes. We got this one done in the spring. Well, actually, Jonathan Worthing did, did most of it. Yay, one down, two to go. Uh, no, not that NSA. This one stands for Native Shaped Arrays. This is all about supporting native arrays and compact collections of native types such as vectors and matrices, those things mathematicians love. In addition to notational convenience, these structures can be processed very quickly and often in parallel. And this part of the project was, is very nearly done, again, by Jonathan. The only reason it's not quite finished is that it's dependent on the third thing. Uh, finally, we're just now doing what we call the great list refactor. Uh, this is the most drastic of the three things we wanted to do because we needed to simplify both the semantics and the implementations of lists. On the downside, this certainly will break some existing programs. On the upside, list processing will be much faster and easier to understand. Much of the arbitrary flattening behavior of Perl 5 lists will be gone, so lists of lists will be much easier to deal with, with the trade-off that occasionally you'll have to flatten your list explicitly when you want that behavior. And this was the riskiest part of what we were doing this year, but we, we thought it was worth it to try. And the risk wasn't all that great because, once again, Jonathan and everyone else have pretty much finished it. Uh, right now, we're, we're at the point where we're just dealing with the, uh, the fallout in the, uh, the, the ecosystem modules. Of course, just because we've done these three things successfully doesn't mean we've succeeded. Earlier this year, uh, I saw a greeting card in a shop window. It read, I fail good. I feel good. Uh, long ago, shortly after we announced the Perl 6 effort in the year 2000, I gave a talk on impossibilities, one of the State of the Union talks. In that talk, I pointed out that Perl 6 was impossible and that we were going to do it anyway. So we absolutely expected to fail, but we also knew that Perl 6 would be a very, very interesting failure and probably quite useful because Perl 5 is already practical and useful and well-loved despite all its failings. So how could you fix what's wrong with Perl 5 and not get something practical and useful? At the very least, we hope to make different mistakes this time around and that it would at least be entertaining. Well, here it is 15 years later and I can gleefully announce that we've successfully failed. And we've pl made plenty of interesting mistakes, different mistakes. And we didn't really get done with everything we set out to do, which is not surprising since it was impossible to begin with. And some of the ideas we had turned out not to be good ideas. We also had lots of good ideas that we just haven't figured out how to implement yet. Uh, for example, I wanted our compiler to be completely bootstrapped on Perl, pull, full Perl 6 by now. Try saying that six times. <laughs> it's not bootstrapped yet. It's really written in a restricted subset of Perl called NQP, which stands for not quite Perl. But that's okay. Uh, the good thing is that we can much more easily port NQP to new architectures because it's simple and to new virtual machines. The portability is worth a lot when you're starting out. We still hope to produce a fully bootstrapped Perl 6 compiler someday, but not until our Perl 6 optimizer produces code that is just about as fast as handcrafted NQP code. And you know, even Frodo failed in the end. After all his persistent endurance, it seemed to be all for nothing. The one ring overcame him, and he claimed the ring for himself. Uh, ironically, Frodo's quest was saved by the one person who least wanted to destroy the ring, Gollum. But you know, even if you know you're going to fail, you still have to do the work. <coughs> Frodo needed good intentions and persistence to get to the point where he could fail usefully. And he needed the help of all his friends to get there. As Sam said, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you. So 
from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank everyone who has carried me over the years. I've been richly blessed to have such companions on my quest to lose my own ring of power. In my case, it's, it's the ring of language design power. You know, many language designers want to tell programmers how to think. But to my mind, the highest goal of a language designer is not to control how you think. No, my goal is to design a language that is self-defining and self-sustaining. sustaining, And more than that, to design a culture around that language that is self-defining and self-sustaining. A good language gets out of the way of the user and lets him or her think of the problem in the terms the problem should be thought about, not in the way the language designer demands. In his preface to The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien explained why The Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. He says, I cordially dislike allegory in its, all its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to, dis to detect its presence. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of the, use of the readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purpose domination of the author. So you see, varied applicability, he says. Tolkien believed in Tim Toady. <laughs> <laughs> it would be difficult to overrate the effects of The Lord of the Rings on my life. I first read it when I was in college, and it really shook me up. It knocked me out of a college career of music and chemistry and knocked me into the wonderful worlds of literature and linguistics. But because my college career failed temporarily, I met my, wi my wife, Gloria, and I impressed her by standing on a chair and reciting Tolkien po poetry. It was like, there was an inn, a merry old inn beneath an old gray hill, and there they brew a beer so brown that the man of the moon himself came down one night to drink his fill. Uh, <laughs> how different the world would have been uh, if Tolkien hadn't been a linguist, and how different the world would have been if I hadn't become a linguist. But you see, because of Tolkien, I believe in the renunciation of power. I choose to give up my power over the users of Perl. That's why I believe there's more than one way to do it. That's why I believe people should have choices and free will. That's why I believe computer programmers should, have, should be creative creatures, whether or not they believe they were created by an ultimate creator. And that's why I like to get, I'd like to get rid of my own ring, to throw it in the fire, or if I can't, at least let someone else carry it to the fire. Still, even if I fail in my quest to get all the way to Mount Doom, I've shared my journey with many dear friends. You guys are my best friends forever. <laughs> um, I just hope you continue to like each other and look out for each other, after I sail off to the Grey Havens. Uh, from the Grey Havens, I guess it would be. It's, it's, which is certain to happen someday. The world takes away all our rings of power in the end, whether we give them up willingly or not. Gee, that sounds like I'm planning to die soon. Uh, quite the contrary, I plan to live to 111. I haven't lost a finger yet, uh, even if they've taken out various other bits of my insides. Uh, maybe I'll live long enough to design Perl 7. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that also has a downside. I'd have to rewrite this talk to compare Perl 7 to the Silmarillion. <laughs> and this talk is already way too long, or maybe too short. Don't know yet. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. And whether then, I cannot say. I don't know where I'm going, but chances are I'm going to a party. Thanks for listening to this old hobbit.
start again somewhere between five and ten minutes from now. The lightning speakers come down and take the front row. First four seats will be for advertisers. Everyone else go do what you got to do. And don't take too long.